This is Mark. Hello. Hi. Hi, this is Jonah. Are you ready to do the interview? Yes, let us do the interview. Okay, great. So what, um, by the way, what, what school is this for anyway? Uh, I, so I go to a uh, town called Mount Horeb and it's for my broadcast communications class Right on. because we have to make like a, like a, a movie trailer or we have to do like a video project and I wanted to do mine like a flat earth trailer. Got it. And so, yeah, I wanted to have this in it. Um, so I'm Jonah and I'm also a ghost hunter. I've been, been a paranormal investigator for like four years. Right on. Good for um, you. Yeah, thank you. I'm 14 years old, um, and so yeah. Uh, first of all, how did the conferences go? Conference went went really, really well. Uh, Dallas was wonderful. It was a great venue. All the speakers did great. Uh, we had a fantastic turnout. The media was awesome. We had media come in from all over the place: France and uh, Brazil and Denmark and Hungary and, and England, and it was was wonderful. So couldn't wouldn't have changed anything. Yeah, I know everyone who went got a free copy of your book autograph. Yeah, that is. Yeah, that. <laughs> I'm, I'm there. That that took five and a half hours to sign. As a matter of fact, <laughs> uh, all those copies because because if I didn't sign them ahead of time, people would have been chasing me around to autograph them, and it would have taken a lot longer. So yeah, yeah. And then I just did the uh -huh. uh, the audio version, and I put that up on YouTube so that uh, the audio version of the book, so that anyone can listen to it now if they want to. Oh, sweet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, first of all, what did you do before Flat Earth, and how did you get into it? Uh, I was a proprietary software trainer for the better part of 20 years out in Boulder, Colorado. So I started playing video games for a living back in the 90s and then transitioned that over to software training. And that's basically what I did all the way up until about 2014 when I got into the flat earth thing. In the summer of 2014, was bored with just about every conspiracy you could think of and decided to make a series of videos on it and put it out to the internet say you know what i can't prove the earth in a court of law anymore as far as the globe goes and then here we are it took me nine months to finally you know b between 2014 and 2015 to finally make my case solid enough to where i was willing to move forward with it and here we are now 2019 just about ready to go into 2020 and this thing's not even beginning to slow down <laughs> Um, is there anyone who has like inspired you in the community or just in general to keep doing flat earth? Uh, everybody, I, the community is just, a, a, a it's way bigger than I ever thought it would be and way stranger. Uh, and there's so many people that are doing great things. I mean, I wouldn't have thought of like going to the beach with high powered, uh, digital cameras and shooting things at long ranges. I wouldn't have thought of doing street activism. I wouldn't have thought of doing conferences. Even, you know, I, I didn't, I really didn't think it was going to get that big. So, uh, one person inspiring me, no, I mean, everybody, I mean, there's of course some outstanding people, most of the people in the touring circuit right now that, that are doing public speaking, but I mean, even the activists are doing amazing stuff. So, uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. Cool. Um, how have you managed to handle like ridicule since you've become a flat earther? Cause I imagine you get a lot. I do get a lot, but not in the uh, conventional sense, meaning I don't get a lot of people that will email me with abuse and they definitely won't call me uh, because, you know, trolls are lazy and trolls don't like to spoof phone numbers. And they don't like to create fake Gmail accounts, even though it doesn't take that long to create a fake Gmail account. Uh, most of it's in the, in the comment section of YouTube, uh, which is amazing. I mean, you know, any, anybody that makes a YouTube video that t is tied to flat earth, they'll get like something like long lines of a 500% increase in comments, which, you know, tracks that helps the metrics of, of whatever video. And so, yeah, people will attack me a lot in there. I mean, 90% of the comments in YouTube, I have never read because there's one, there's just too many of them. And two, uh, you know, why would I read horrible, horrible stuff as far as getting angry or upset about the abuse? 
it'd be hypocritical for me to do so because five years ago I would have been in this doing the same thing. I would have been mm-hmm. saying, oh yeah, you're an idiot, you're dumbass, blah, 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 and you know, making all this stuff up. And it's like, look, I, nowadays it's like, yeah, I, I get it. I, I see where you're upset, but you've heard the old sports saying, it's like, they're not angry at the player. They're angry at the game. And yeah. they, you know, going after me, I mean, you know, it's why I put myself there. It's like, hey, take, you know, take a shot at me. You know, try to, you know, if you killed me tomorrow, it would do nothing to the community. It would just make it stronger. You know, why people don't learn from Obi-Wan, I, I have no idea. <laughs> um, so, yeah, what are your best points for the Earth being flat? My best points for the Earth being flat. Okay, I'll give you the, the, the well-known story of the um, Georgetown physicist that a German television company got a hold of. And they said, okay, Mark, come up with five scientific bullet points that we can throw at this guy. And, you know, we'll see if he responds. And so the five um, things were, first one is long distance photography, which is, you know, 10 years ago, one of the biggest arguments, if not the biggest argument for going after the flat earth was, okay, we'll boats go over to the horizon and we can see them going over the horizon and they're gone forever. Now, we all know this, right? Well, long distance photography, digital HD cameras have changed all that. Now the boat that used to be gone is not gone anymore. You just crank up the zoom and magically it's there again. And you can keep doing this over and over again until, you know, you get to distances basically to where the, the atmosphere gets so thick you can't, you can't see it anymore anyway because it just blurs out. Um, second one would be gravity versus the vacuum of space which is a wonderful little thought experiment. And that is, let's say if there's a second floor to your building right now and you make that into a vacuum chamber, you put a cork in the ceiling and you pop that cork, what happens? Well, the pressure is violent, it's instant. You you know, you're probably going to lose consciousness and probably die on top of it. So, but, but, so my question is, why didn't gravity hold that air where you are right now instead of going upstairs? And that's where you just expand it out. It's like, okay, gravity of this world with a much, much bigger vacuum chamber, which is space. Why is our atmosphere mm-hmm. still on here? And then, you know, you come back and say, well, gravity. I go, Ooh, no, no, no. That earlier experiment still applies here. It's the exact same gravity. Where does space begin? Where does our atmosphere end? Nobody can tell us exactly because it's this bleeding edge of space. Third... Uh, would be the eclipse shadow. The eclipse shadow is way too small for a 2,000 mile wide object. The moon is 2,000 miles wide. The the blackout zone shouldn't be 70 miles wide. It's tiny. It's 97% decrease. And you know you can come up with all the wonderful optics you want and say that oh no it's condensing it down to this tiny 70 mile spot. I'm saying doesn't it make more sense because you know we say the moon is actually around you know around that size. So why wouldn't it make more sense in our model? And you're saying, well, you know, it's that that's you know light uh, magnification, and you know again how it's condensing the the beams down. It's like okay, fine. Then what happens when the Earth goes in front of the Sun? If the Earth is eight thousand miles wide, then that blackout zone should it be at least four times as wide, two hundred fifty miles, give or take. We should see this big black circle show up on the moon we don't we see this giant fuzzy red you know blood moon what why don't we see the blackout zone what where's where's the freaking blackout zone it's not there fourth is the moon temperature moon temperature uh shouldn't be cold which is you all know that it's, uh, it's 90 degrees in the sun but it's 80 degrees in this in the shade well it's because whatever object is blocking some of the sun's heat in the, in the moonlight it's the exact opposite so it's 50 degrees in the moonlight but it's 60 degrees in the moon shade why is it warmer in the shade than the moonlight if the moon is reflecting some of the sun's light that's it's not possible in fact we see up to 13 degrees swing sometime you can test this with a point and click thermometer you pick up at the hardware store for 20 bucks and we've done this many many times and if you magnify the moonlight that moonlight gets even colder. And this is something we can replicate now in universities. It's called a cool laser. In fact, we use it in cosmetic surgery sometimes. So why isn't anybody talking about this? You know, does that prove a flat earth? No, it does not. But it just blows away the relationship between the sun and the moon. Last question is the Van Allen radiation belts, which is, are the Van Allen belts deadly? Yes or no? <clears throat> and if you say yes... 
they are deadly, then fine. How the Americans get round trips through them to the moon and back with no shielding whatsoever against the radiation, meaning the only things that can stop radiation are gold, lead, and a whole bunch of water. We use none of those things. So then you come back and say, well, they're probably not that deadly then. We, I made a mistake. You know, Change your answer. Okay, well, then you can go to the NASA.gov website and look up a video called Orion Trial by Fire, and which they go into great detail about how they're not going to send manned capsules into that zone anytime soon because they haven't solved the radiation problem. And this was made in the end of 2014. Ooh, well, it's kind of a problem because they solved the radiation problem perfectly in the 1960s. Absolutely flawlessly. Nobody died. Nobody got radiation poisoning. Nobody even got cancer. There's still five of these guys walking around right now. Between those five questions that I threw out there, at the Germ or, I'm sorry, at the uh, German television team and the astrophysicist out of Georgetown, that was it. The guy folded. He said, "Nope, I'm not doing this." That was it. And then the segment never ran because of it. I mean, I've got the interview, you know, with the, with the German team, you know, on my channel, but the the astrophysicist would not respond. So there you go. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, how do you think religions or just like society in general would react to? Like, all of a sudden being told that the Earth is flat. Religion would be, which is why I talked about it in the clues, religion would be under the most pressure because they would be so tempted to exact revenge on science, which has been beating all the major religious houses f over the heads with textbooks for the last five centuries. They've been basically been building their institution of science at the expense of religion. And... All of a sudden, you're at you're you're asking religion to show restraint. <laughs> yeah, that's probably not going to go over too well. I mean, because the questions wouldn't stop there; it would start with flat Earth. It's like, okay, so you were really wrong about a big thing called the globe. What else are you wrong about? Like, uh, I don't know, Big Bang theory, carbon dating, evolution, dark matter, so on and so on. It would just never end. So, yeah, religion, which is one of the reasons why this thing has been kept a secret for as long as it has. And by the way, I'm, I'm saying secret in that the, I'm not saying that this has been a secret for thousands of years. I'm saying that we didn't even know for sure. We didn't even have the tech to know for sure until about 1960. And then when we, the best and brightest, figured it out in 1960 that we we're actually in a building with walls and a floor and a ceiling, they went over these possible scenarios and said yeah let's just lock this thing down for a while so yeah um so if it's flat and enclosed then who do you think created it well you only got two choices uh, one is a much older wiser and powerful civilization than ourselves some some technology based civilization that can has mastered the unified field and just about every form of engineering you can think of or the divine but at that point you're kind of splitting hairs because any you know it's kind of the old old comparison between magic and science you know science is just really magic without mystery it's just repeatable magic that's all it really is uh and when you're talking about advanced an advanced civilization versus a deity again you know it's really six and one half a dozen of another because they would have ability they would have technology and abilities that we would distinguish you know you couldn't distinguish from the divine so but it's one of those two yeah um so if it was either god or some advanced civilization why why would they try and keep it hidden from us well think about it this way if every one of the five major religious houses of this world, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity, they all want the same thing. They all want the meaning of life. They all want the answer. And you all of a sudden give those five groups, which represent most of the population, you give them all leverage against science. Isn't it possible that religion might try to tear down the very foundations of science? And, and I have been asked this by, by heavy science um, groups like National Geographic, for example, which is part of the reason why I titled the book, you know, The End of the World, uh, because they were asking me, it's, you know, they're saying if Flat Earth gets its way, could we be ushering in a new dark age? 
I was like, I don't think so. But at the same time, I don't want to, you know, it's like, it's like we haven't been burning down any libraries or anything like that. So anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I saw the movie Behind the Curve. Um, yeah. And I didn't understand the ending. He just said, oh, that's interesting. And then the credits rolled and I didn't understand what was happening. Can you sure. like explain to me what, what happened? At oh, the end? yeah, 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 sure. So, well, I can tell you how the, what, how the director wanted the people to react to the ending. They wanted, the, they wanted Jaron to look bad so because he, he wasn't getting the results he, he thought he would. Uh, and the director hated Flat Earth. Oh, my God, he hated Flat Earth so much by the end of it because he, he didn't realize as he got into it, he just realized it was big, way bigger than he thought and way more enthusiastic. And so the, the problem with the experiment at the end was that Jaron, so you're supposed to shoot a laser across a flat surface, but Jaron never bothered to see if the surface, this kind of dirt road that he was on next to a dike uh, was even flat. He waited till it was nighttime and tried to do it live the first time. He didn't even realize until he went out months later during the day. It's like, oh, wow, I didn't even have line of sight. The director didn't know this either. The director didn't even go out early enough. He just thought, well, if the laser, he couldn't see the laser light until he raised it up, it must mean that the earth is curved. Well, no, it just meant in this case that he wasn't even on a flat surface. It was partially Jaron's fault, and I can understand why the director did what he did. It kind of backfired on him, though, because, or didn't have that much of an impact because that was the very last scene of the movie. And by the time you were done, and I've sat in, in several of the audiences that, that watch this film in theaters, and by the time you got there, you, you'd already been in 100 minutes. Well, 100 minutes of a Flat Earth movie for someone that's never, ever watched Flat Earth, your mind's already going in a whole bunch of different directions. I mean, I asked tons of people afterwards. I said, did you watch the experiment at the end? And they said, yes. I go, do you know what happened? They go, no. I, they said, but it was bad, right? I go, well, it wasn't good, but you know what happened? They go, no. Nobody understood. The 99 out of 100 people in the audience didn't even know, like you, didn't even know what the experiment was supposed to turn out like. Yeah. Um, okay, interesting. So... I asked you this question on the phone last time, um, but for the video, how, how does the sun set on a flat Earth? Okay. Uh, the sun doesn't actually set. It just goes away. And I'll give you two quick examples. First is that, you remember, the sun is really, really small by comparison. You know, yep. that's, that's one of the most mm -hmm. common misconceptions. We are the artist interpretation. When we draw flat Earth maps, we have to make the sun like a thousand miles wide just so people can see it. But technically, we, we all say, it's oh, no, it's probably less than 50 miles wide, and it's just going off into the distance. You say, well, but it looks like it's setting. It's like, no, it's just going off, and the thickness of the atmosphere just b blurs it out until finally it just goes away. And you're saying, well, no, you know, the light should, you should be able to see the light forever. I go, okay, think of it this way. And I don't know if you're, you're, you've ever done scuba diving or you've known anyone that scuba dives, but yeah. why don't you see the sun? Why is the sun completely gone at 200 feet down when you're when you're scuba diving it's like keep it high noon sun's right above you you cannot see it in fact it's really really dark at 200 feet in fact at, a, at 90 feet you lose all colors except for blue why because of the thickness of the water well what you're breathing in now is really just a thin version of water uh, i know the formula isn't exactly correct but so like if water is h2o you, you know what we're breathing in you're barely even breathing in oxygen most people don't even know that uh it's n it's in four parts nitrogen to one part oxygen you're breathing in 80 percent nitrogen it's like what's your point my point is it's just you're basically breathing in a thin liquid and so that liquid like anything else when you go off to the distance 50 100 200 miles gets thicker and thicker and thicker until finally it just blurs whatever it's out including the brightest object in the sky which is the sun uh, there's wonderful videos I could show you where you zoom in on the sun with a digital camera with a filter on that sun pops right back up from your eyes. Oh, wow. it, from your eyes, it looks like it's setting, but you zoom in. Nope, not anymore. It's not. It's like, okay. So. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so how did Amelia Earhart and like some other people that have supposedly traveled around the world 
Um, how did they do that? Was it like a hoax or what? No, 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 no. Um, as a matter of fact, Amelia Earhart's a great example. The boats, the, okay, I'll give you the boat examples first, like Galileo. You know, it's, that one gets thrown at us a lot. It's like, well, Gal Galileo sailed around the world. You know, he circumnavigated the globe. And I go, okay, take a dinner plate, take your finger, draw a big circle around your dinner plate, you know, with your finger. Technically, you got back to the same spot, right? Well, you circumnavigated that dinner plate. Does it make that dinner plate a globe? No, it does not. It just means that you, you know, circumnavigated the dinner plate. Um, with Amelia Earhart, she died trying to circumnavigate the world in a plane. And the reason was is because she was um, flying in, you know, her, her maps were wrong. The, the, sub, the When it comes to the, the mainstream maps, they are off. And if you have a single engine plane or a double engine plane, or I think she was using a single engine, if your fuel capacity, which is based on specific measurements on that map are wrong, all of a sudden you're going to get to a part and it's like, wait, there's no island to land on and you're not even close. And she had to ditch. And I think that's what happened. I think she was dipping too far in the Southern hemisphere and the, the maps were off and that's how she died. Okay. Um, yeah, so if NASA and, like, other leaders of the world have known that it was flat since 1960, yeah. how do you think everyone has managed to keep it a secret? Like, no, no one has, like, spilled it. Because nobody knew. That's the, the short answer. Uh, what I mean is compartmentalization, very effective in the military, and NASA is just a branch of the United States military. I mean, granted, they don't carry guns, they wear all white and they smile for the camera, but that doesn't mean anything. They are uniquely military. And when it comes to them uh, doing their, you know, hiding it, 99% of the people there don't need to know. Hence the term need to know. Uh, which means, you know, if you polish uh, capsules or you do fuel systems or you do, uh, you know, all your turning wrenches, you don't need to know any of this stuff. The only guys that need to know, I mean, if you want to build a rocket and fire it up, great, fantastic. It's a, NASA is a wonderful employer in that regard. But the only guys that need to know are the telemetry guys, the guys that handle the data, the guys that say, okay, the rocket is here. It's traveling at this speed, at this trajectory, you know, plotting all the, the numbers, you know, because, it, you know, it goes out of visual range very, very quickly. And so between, you know, we're talking a very, very few amount of people. And that would be the same in any space agency. You know, everybody blueprinted off of NASA and the Soviet Union, uh, mostly NASA, because we got you know, way better production techniques. So. Okay. Uh, so I'm sure you probably heard of the simulation theory. Mm -hmm. And that's something that like a lot of flat earthers believe. Is that something you believe too? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I do. Um, simulation theory I remember I worked in the video game industry and worked in software for decades I know full well what we're trying to achieve and what every movie is has tried to exploit for years I mean what's interesting is that people don't truly get it because at the core of software it is really nerdy stuff you know it's it's math and it's code and people don't get it they get the visuals you know people will play the video games but they have no idea what it takes to make those video games. And so when it comes to like virtual reality, what I, what I try to tell people is like, look, if it's flat and it's enclosed, it's probably digital. Because every simulation that we make, every game that we make from GTA to Fortnite to Warcraft or whatever, it's flat and it's enclosed. It's this giant square box or rectangle box with a shallow ceiling on it known as a sky box, which is interesting enough that's what we uh that's what we do we build these things and the average person doesn't get it i mean you gotta remember like the it's 2019 the matrix is 20 years old now 20 years old nobody gets it it's like oh yeah he dodged bullets and all this other stuff it's like uh yeah there's a little more than that you know the the whole concept of virtual reality is so far beyond people that the what i try to you know i i can only go i can only start with the basic building blocks which is if it's, vir if it's virtual and it's enclosed, it's flat. It's, it's, it's yeah. plain and simple. And the reason why it's flat is because it's easier to code. The average player does not know that GTA is perfectly flat or Fortnite or Warcraft or whatever game is perfectly flat. I mean, Minecraft is too obvious. And that is meaning 
if the average person doesn't know, then you don't tell them. And they, you, know, you can tell them whatever you want. You can make up, a, say, oh, you know, the world's this shape. But, we, you know, if they don't experience it uh, in the first person, they don't know. Um, but everybody knows, like, you know, real quick. It's like a simulation. A perfect example of simulation would be you see a mountain off in the distance, right? But you know full well, mm -hmm. because you know the rules of the game, you're never going to be on that other side of that mountain. So do the programmers draw and render everything on the other side of that mountain? No, they do not. Why? Well, why would you? It's a waste. So it's this weird illusion that we all fall into that we're willing, you know, we volunteered to go into this illusion. Anyway, that's it. Oh. Uh, have you ever received any like threats or comments from anyone who might be behind the secret? Oh, you mean like heavy hand, you know, like men in black type thing? Um, yeah. No, no. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, nobody. In fact, I, I haven't run into anybody in the community that's uh, run into any resistance, pro or against. You know, nobody's offered me a briefcase full of money, and I've never seen any black sedans or helicopters following me, and nobody's, you know, pushed me up against a wall and said, <laughs> yeah, you better keep your mouth shut or something like that. Um, as a matter of fact, we've been the resistance we've gotten from mainstream media and giant corporations has been token at best. We really, I mean, I mean, up until very, very recently, YouTube was promoting us a lot. I mean, the first three years, they couldn't stop promoting us. We were making them a lot of money. We were a binge watch for them. You know, YouTube's the uh, the biggest television network in the world. I don't know why mainstream media has recognized this. I mean, Net Netflix has nothing compared to those guys, and they uh, they were recommending us at every turn. So. Okay. Oh uh, yeah. So, how do you explain like tide? Because it's supposedly the water that's facing the moon is getting like pulled up. Um, how would you explain that? <laughs> A physics engine, no different, and, and it's way worse than that. I mean, I'm saying that the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets have no effect on the gravity of this world at all, which would go right in line with uh, a physics engine in any sort of simulation. You know, how do things, I mean, you, you're, you were born into games, you've heard of a physics engine. Uh, how do um, things fall in Fortnite? Well, the game just tells it to fall at a certain rate. That's all there is to it. So if you have water in some sort of, you know, simulation, or even if it wasn't, if you want to say it's mechanical, that's fine. Uh, the last thing you would want to do, because we're talking, if the moon is so small, the last thing you would do is, is create some sort of direct gravitational wave beam coming from this really, really tiny object. Oh my God, it'd be, it'd be hell to program. So you would, li it'd just be a modification of the gravity routine which is you have normal gravity and then for the water you can shift the gravity here and there and cause a little bit of a tidal thing if you want wouldn't wouldn't be tough to do at all way more efficient to do it underneath than it would be from up above okay so you're saying there's things like underwater that are causing that to happen oh yeah well, i'm literally saying we're in a giant building you know that's i i couldn't i don't know if i could be more clear here i mean we are you're in a machine you know, could, might as well be a Hollywood studio. And there are things underneath your feet that are very mechanical or at the very least digital by nature. And they are controlling everything from the, uh, the jet stream above to the underwater conveyor system, to the magma system, to the gravity, to the birds in the sky. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the moon landings. Uh, what have you seen from the videos that have that have kind of suggested that they were faked. The moon landings, it wasn't just the moon landings that were faked. The entire NASA program, which started in 1958, was built to keep this thing a secret, keep the world we live a secret. Meaning if the United States government figured it out around late 1956, what the world actually looked like. And then they put the Antarctic Treaty in around 1959, and NASA was formed in 1958. They militarized space, and they tried to make space boring, but a military venture that was so unaffordable that no private sector could get into it. For a long time, that was absolutely true. But if you look at any Apollo photos, let's, let's, don't even worry about Mercury or Gemini or Pioneer or Voyager or any of that stuff. Let's just look at Apollo real quick, any of the moon missions. There's, I could give you just 
any photo from the moon missions, and there's at least half a dozen things wrong with that photo. Um, first off, shadows intersecting. We all know one light source, the shadows run parallel to each other. It's it's just a law of physics. Just, yeah. and, and that doesn't happen on the moon. The, the shadows are intersecting all over the place. The only way that can happen is if there's multiple light sources or if the light source is really, really close. Like, I don't know, a spotlight in the studio. Uh, second thing would be the, the capsule itself, supposedly an engine in that thing that generates 10,000 pounds of thrust, and yet there is no splay pattern, not nothing below that thing to indicate that the ash has been moved at all. Uh, third, too obvious, would be that the, no, there's no stars in any shot in, in uh, Apollo and Mercury and Gemini, and you're saying, well, that's an exposure setting. It's like, well, okay, why didn't you change the exposure settings at least for one roll of film? never did it it was like and but i knew why and you would never ever do it because the mathematics involved would be too problematic um, meaning everything was date time stamped well if the belt of orion isn't perfectly in its place in every shot uh it would somebody's gonna find it and they're gonna find it very very quickly and so they said oh God, let's just get rid of the stars that was actually the safer move to do it because had they left the stars in this we, we wouldn't even be talking now um Another thing would be, I don't know, the big satellite dish they, they put on the moon, that thing's a VHF transmitter. You can look it up. It's not secret technology. It's got an active range, maybe 50 miles on a good day. And even then you're pumping out probably Morse code. And this thing was supposedly generating two-way communication with 10 frames per video, uh, per second video, uh, and pinpoint accuracy to where there was never any snow. <laughs> It was, and, and you could do, you know, perfect audio, you know, back and forth with almost no delay. I, I've never seen anything like it. Um, but the big one, the, the one that blows me away more than anything, uh, because again, people, the average person on the street doesn't know mathematics. They don't know anything about physics. They don't know anything about engineering or chemistry or any of that stuff. And which is the spacesuits violates one of the laws of thermodynamics, which is pressure needs a container, plain and simple. Uh, you, by that pressure cannot exist next to non-pressure without some sort of barrier. So if you pump up a basketball, it gets pretty rigid, right? You can't fold it. You can't, you know, burst it unless you're, you know, really, really, really yeah. strong. So why doesn't a spacesuit act like that? Because remember, uh, a basketball is just a little extra added pressure on the inside and we're not anywhere near a vacuum on the outside. And the vacuum is really, really tight. Spacesuits should do the same thing and they're not. They're perfectly flexible. The, the arms, the legs, the joints, they're all articulation points. They're perfect. They're fingers. You can manipulate complex electronics. And you're saying, what's the point? I'm going, my point is that the, those astronauts should have turned into parade floats immediately and they should have burst and died. And you're saying, and some people say, oh, we just didn't put that much pressure and like half an atmosphere inside. It's like, oh, it makes no damn difference. You want to see, you yeah. want to see a, a perfect image of that. Take a, like a, like an old, you can look this up on, on online. It's easy. Look up a toy called Stretch Armstrong. You know, they, they put nowadays, you know, you can make little vacuum chambers and, you know, you put these things, these toys in these va vacuum chambers, they explode. They die horribly. And this was with almost no pressure inside. So what, what magical technology inside that spacesuit stopped the vacuum of space? It doesn't exist. Uh, I went so far. And so it's one of my challenges. I say, you know, it's one of my things I put, I've been running it for a couple of years now. Or I said, okay, I go, here's my challenge. I will quit Flat Earth tomorrow or sacrifice myself for Flat Earth. Find me any spacesuit <laughs> from any era because they all worked perfectly. Nobody has ever died in a spacesuit, which statistically is impossible. Find me a spacesuit, give me in a vacuum chamber and pull the switch. Tell me how I live. I couldn't. There's no way I could live. And, and that's why you won't see any f actual footage of astronauts self, you know, self-contained space suits. None of this tethered stuff, you know, because all they were doing was wearing this weird backpack, on, you know, on their, on their backs. <laughs> so what was in that backpack to stop the vacuum of space? And even if, even if you could convince me, oh yeah, it's 2019 and, and they had this magical technology now, not 1969, they didn't, they had analog technology in 1969. So how they do it? I mean, find me, in fact, find me an audio recording of an astronaut actually looking at his air gauge 
and telling, you know, you ever hear that? Any of the recordings? It's like, oh, yeah, I got 17 minutes of air left. Oh, I got, you know, three minutes. No one ever talked about it. It's, it was like this mystery. No, no one ever ran out of air or even came close. It reminded me so much of, not to bring up a sore subject, it reminded me of the Star Wars dilemma, which was the first eight, eight movies, there were no gas gauges in Star Wars. And all of a sudden, in The Last Jedi, it's like, uh, they added gas gauges. It's like, what are you talking about? There's no gas gauges in Star Wars. It's like, why, why would you do that? So, anyway, sorry, I ramble. Uh, so, like, the the rockets that were getting shot up into space, like, what did, did they just come back down? Or Oh, yeah, they, you, 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 you want to have some fun? You could, you could research this in 10 seconds. Type into Google, uh, time lapse. Um, NASA rocket trajectory. They all go sideways almost immediately. They go up and then they go horizontal and they go off into the ocean and they ditch. And no one watches this. Everyone's like, you know, because people get bored. You know, it's rockets going up, goes up a few miles and then people just stop looking. Then it just goes horizontal and it goes off into the ocean. Why would these rockets go horizontal at all? Why? Yeah. It just doesn't even make any damn sense. Uh, but the average person... Again, the general public, they absorb entertainment media. That's all they want. That's all they crave. Uh, the other stuff, I mean, remember back when, when I was a kid, we had a, actually had to trick kids into learning with something called Schoolhouse Rock, where we just we, we <laughs> built school lessons into cartoons, you know, and played them on Saturday and Sunday mornings. It's like, oh, wow, I'm actually learning something. Uh, so, yeah, is there, like, anything on the Flat Earth model that – you have a hard time explaining or something that hasn't been figured out about flat earth yet. Oh, sure. There's plenty of things. Um, but the, but the holes in the flat earth model aren't nearly as big as the, as the ones in the globe. That's the best part. I mean, if you consider, and I'll give you an example real quick, uh, which is one would be the Antarctic sun. That's probably the weakest one for us because if the flat earth model is, is literal, then the Antarctic sun has to have a secondary light source. You can't do it with just one light source. You have to have a second one or a projection of the sun going, you know, that's being manipulated somehow. I don't know. That's probably the weakest one. But if you take, um, cause I'm a big fan of plot holes. And if you take the, the globe story and the flat earth story and you, you know, consider them like story boats, you know, going from point A to point B, if there's too many plot holes, the boat sinks and nobody believes it. Well, there's way more, way more holes in the globe than there is the flat earth, which is why I love saying, uh, can I prove to you the flat earth right now? No, I cannot. Can I create so much reasonable doubt in the globe that the only place you have left to turn is some sort of flat earth model? Yeah, I can all day long. And you say, well, reasonable doubt isn't good enough. It's like, well, yeah, it is actually, you know, we, we you, reasonable doubt saves the day in court all the time. And so, uh, so yeah, there, there may be a few holes in flat earth, but nothing uh, overcomable and nothing compared to what, what we do with the globe. Yeah. Um, so you talked about in 2014, you were interested in a lot of conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. What are some other ones that you believe in or that you're just really interested in? Uh, all of them. I mean, I've, I've had my opinion on just about everything you can think of. I like the big ones. I like the big American ones. For whatever reason, we seem to do everything bigger and better in America, including those. Uh, so, I don't know, going all the way back to just about every mer major American war, um, JFK, World Trade Center, uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, the moon missions, of course, those were some of the big ones. Uh, you know, and the other conspiracies, which were more like mysteries, like um, Area 51 or Roswell or something like that. But I'll give you, I'll give you one that you probably haven't even heard of, uh, but I did put it in the book. And that was, I, I think it's an exclusive one that I came up with on my own, but it gives you kind of the definition of conspiracy. And that would be the Panama Canal. And you'd say, okay, well, what, what, what's so conspiratorial about that? And I go, well, think about it this way. The Hoover Dam or any other major uh, major engineering project yeah a few people die you know that's part of the, the cost of doing business people die when you build big things and the hoover dam we lost 70 people do you have any people we lost making the panama canal the better part of six thousand. and you're saying wow that's a lot and then i say well yeah but they died of malaria and yellow fever 
And then you say, well, that's, you know, that's what happens. You know, it's Central America. People die of, of malaria. And so it's, and it's like, where's the conspiracy? I go, the conspiracy is that the United States government knew full well we were going to lose that many guys, thousands of men. And we sent them anyway because the ends justified the means. Most conspiracies are tied to that. The ends just find the means. And you're saying, well, that's not true. I go, actually, it is true because the French started, the French started the Panama Canal, not us. The French lost so many men, they had to quit. They lost over 20,000 guys, and they didn't, you know, granted, they didn't have mosquito netting or repellent or anything like that. They're French people. And, but, they, but they abandoned us. They abandoned the project, and America st came in. It's like, well, we could probably lose 10,000 and still pull it off as long as we finish it, and they did. And it was, the ends did justify the means. It was a great military strike point, um, and it was the most expensive toll, roll in uh, toll road in history. We made a lot of money. The point was, is the, here's where the conspiracy is, is if you're a recruiter and you're recruiting, remember, this isn't military, this is civilians, engineers. If you're recruiting people for this, do you tell them that there's a one in eight chance that they're going to die down there? No, no, you don't. So that's the conspiracy. When three or more people conspire for something that is either, either uh, illegal or unethical, it's a conspiracy, but... The news won't report on conspiracies. They label them differently. So they'll call them scandals unless somebody dies. And then they'll call them a tragedy. It's 9-11 or like a 9-11 event or 9-11 tragedy, Pearl Harbor tragedy, stuff like that. But yeah, I believe in it. For me, if, uh, if the ends justify the means, it's like, oh yeah, I get it. I, my big thing is to understand why the conspiracy did, happened. Not if it happened. Why, why would you do it? And for a lot of them, yeah, absolutely. Pearl Harbor, 9-11, uh, JFK, every American war. Believe it or not, I actually, I understand why the, the, those conspiracies happen. Yeah, I watch a lot of Shane Dawson, so I'm big into him too. Um, so I got one more question. Yeah. Uh, what do you think should be the next big step to proving that the Earth is flat? <sighs> Other than me dying in a vacuum chamber, um, probably, <laughs> probably getting somebody to put a 4K camera on any rocket that's going to leave orbit. That's the way to do it, um, because we we can tear apart Photoshop. You know, with, with you know, we can tear apart anything with Photoshop. So, or video editor, or Studio Pro, or whatever it is. So, when it comes to if you put a 4K camera on a, on any sort of rocket and let it take off, point the camera down, put it on the top capsule, the one that's leaving orbit, leave that thing running and make sure the footage is absolutely unedited. Yeah, that'd probably do it. That'd, that'd probably help us a lot. It wouldn't cost necessarily that much money. Of course, you get we have to get authorization from whatever rocket was going up, which is going to be tough to do. But what I think is more interesting is that never in the history of space travel has the, that footage ever been taken. How, how is that even remotely possible? It's not. Statistically, there are so many things that should have happened in space or shouldn't have happened in space that have or haven't. And it goes way, you know, kind of like when I, there was a guy that found out that he's going, no astronaut has ever taken the camera and spun around, did a 360 with it. Um, this is never ever, I mean, RT attempted to do it, but of course the, the footage was utterly faked. The, um, we broke that down in two seconds. Um, so many, like, why is an astronaut never, never died in space with all the, all, everything that we put up there worked perfectly every time, including the space capsule, by the way, you know, that capsule that landed on the moon that was never tested here. I know the guy that tested the primary version of it. He was an older gentleman that lived right next to me in Boulder, Colorado. And he built a convertible model, and they didn't even use his, his design at all. The model you see, that capsule that's sitting on the moon, had, was never tested here. It's like, when, 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 when is that? It's not even possible. So, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, all right. Well, that's everything I got. Uh, thank you so much for doing this interview. Uh, yeah. Yeah. My dad has a question, actually. Sure. Hi, Mark. How are you? Hi. Hi, hey, thanks so much for doing this. Um, really, really appreciate it. Um, I, I have one question for you, if you don't mind. Sure. And that is, you know, you've been doing this for years, and obviously you started out a skeptic, and, and you became a believer as time has gone on. Yeah. I'm curious to know, uh, 
you know, as far as throughout the years, if you discover that maybe there is a, a part of the country, a part of the world that um, tends to uh, follow this more, or there are diff different demographics or ages or, or um, you know, those kinds oh, of things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, part it's very curious to me. Well, no, no, it's, it's good. Um, part of you know part of what i do is i i can keep my finger on just about every every aspect of flat earth that's out there yeah there are some countries that we do better in uh like second to the united states and all the other english speaking countries because you know we're we're the ones kind of pushing forward because a lot of the content is made in english like indonesia is really really big um russia is surprisingly big um quite a bit of Europe. Uh, other than that, the, I think the toughest one for us to get into right now is China, but everybody else is really, really open to the concept. So it's it, we get into just about every demographic you can think of. And um, your son is, is a perfect example of this. Um, a, a real quick stat, let me throw it at you. There was a U.gov survey that came out two years ago. And they were asking, it was a, a British research team that was polling Americans and asking about stuff. And they asked about Flat Earth. And when they got to the 18 to 24-year-olds in the U.S., there was a full 34% that was skewing, you know, skeptical against the globe. And then when you got below 18, uh, it was skewing up to like 53%. And they couldn't even talk mm -hmm. to them, but we, we saw poll, straw polls in other places. So again, sorry, I don't, don't want to drag this out, but it's whatever for whatever the reason. Well, actually, I can give you the reason real fast. Um, it doesn't matter how rich, how powerful, how beautiful, how talented you are. Flat Earth seems to get into those demographics because it's bigger. It's such a huge concept that no matter what your status is in life, it seems to sneak into the conversation. And let me end it with this. So when you're talking, when people go out and they talk with their friends, uh, usually when you're older, you get into this routine where it's like, okay, you know, you talk about the weather and local sports teams and people you know, you know, mutually know. But at the end of the conversation, it always comes down to the people trying to exchange two or three interesting stories. It's like, oh, yeah, I heard that eating three ounces of dark chocolate, you know, prevents cancer. It's like, oh, wow. <laughs> and then somebody else. But now this is kind of in the back pocket of people. Um, in fact, here, I'll, I'll give you a quick one real fast, um, which is and I, I won't give you the actor's name necessarily uh, because I, I don't want it necessarily to come out in the high school project. You know what? You know what? Let's let's do it anyway. Heck with it. It's been long enough. Okay. So let's, let's tell it anyway. I don't care. Seriously, I'm really surprised the flyer. There's a lot of people in the flyer community know this, and they they never talked about it. So there, I had a chance to hang out with. Um, um, oh wow, I'm gonna have to edit this out. Uh, uh, shoot, that's okay. I'll 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 edit this one segment. You know what? I'll. That's fine. So, but I'll tell you guys. No, it's it's fine. No, I'll, I'll kill it. I'll I'll kill the, I'll kill the end of this because on my audio, are you you're recording the audio on your side, right? Yeah. yeah, we are. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I had a chance to um talk with if you know who he is, uh, big big oh, yeah. yeah, big television actor out in, out in L.A. And we were talking about this and that, and he says uh, he goes, hey, don't you want to know how I found out about? I go, sure. How did you find out about it? And he said, Amy Adams told me at the Oscars this year. And I said, really? And this, you'll, you'll understand what I mean this. And he goes, yeah, she hates it. And I go, really? And he goes, yeah. He goes, we were all talking about all these conspiracy, whispering about conspiracies and stuff. And all of a sudden she comes up, she goes, no, 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 no. You can put all that, you know, that stuff to bed. Let me tell you the BS my father's into. And she starts railing against it. And because she was railing against it, a lot of people don't know that it doesn't matter if you love a topic or you hate a topic, as long as you're passionate about it. And if you're passionate about a topic, people will listen to you. And she was converting people into Flat Earth because she hated it so much. And wow. that's kind of, so that kind of, kind of gives you an idea of the demographics. If we can get into that, just because of people making, you know, trying to, trying to tear, it's like you, when somebody comes to you and says really enthusiastically, you shouldn't look into this. What are you going to do when you get home? You're going to look into right. it. It's, and that's. Bad, no, bad, the, the what? 
I said, like, any, any publicity is good publicity. Yeah, Thank any you. publicity is good publicity, and plus it's that negative, it's reverse psychology or, or conditioning. If I tell you right now, no matter what you do, no matter what I say, don't think about elephants. You know, the, the, <laughs> right. the second I do that, you're going to think about elephants. And I could rattle, just rattle off topics. And so we, we seem to fight against that. And so, yeah, we because of that, sorry, that kind of goes into your country question. That that's, Flat Earth is so easy to explain to people, the basic core of it, that it, it goes beyond borders and language. You know, you can, you can see that conversation having, happening everywhere. You want, you want to have some fun. Uh, let me end with this. If you want to have some fun, take Flat Earth, change it to another language. So say, if, you know, type in like English to Russian or English to Chinese or whatever it is. Type in Flat Earth, convert, it, convert that to the equivalent in, let's say, Russian, and then plug that back into Google and watch what happens. Now, you won't be able to understand a lot of what's happening. And you'll have to do a translation yourself, but it's it's freaking everywhere. And so I, I don't have no idea what my schedule is going to be like next year, but I'm going to be busy. <laughs> well, you know what? It's fascinating. And uh, I got to tell you, we've, uh, you know, Jonah has been involved in um, your uh, podcasts and, and your YouTube channels. And we were coming back from the West. We were out in the Wyoming area. Oh, wow. And we listened to you for probably six hours uh, coming home in the car. Oh, no. And, uh, we, we, I'm so no, sorry. It's, <laughs> no. It's all good, man. It's all good. Well, that's 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 not good because I just I just posted the audio copy of my latest book, and that actually runs about five hours and forty minutes. So, <laughs> oh sweet. Yeah, you'll have fun. You'll have fun with that. So you don't you don't even have to buy the hard copy. You can just listen to that thing because I'm not I'm not waiting for my publisher in this case. It's like, eh, it's too close to Christmas. Let's just get this thing out there. Uh, hey, can I ask a question? I know we've taken up a lot of your time. Oh no, sure. This is Jonah's mom, by the way. Hi. Okay, so we were. Hi, and thank you so much for talking to my son. Oh, yeah. Really cool. Um, so, with all the conspiracy theories and things you were talking about when you, you guys were talking about spaceships, it just, or it, it just made me think um, one of the big things that I remember when I was in high school was when the Challenger blew up. Right. And I guess my thought is that was that, to my knowledge, that's the only time that they ever tried to take a civilian out. And they were, you know, so she was just a teacher. She wasn't, she wouldn't have been in on anything. Right. And so part of me was like, well, I wonder if that really wasn't an accident. Because if they would have taken her up, then she would have come back and been like, well, that wasn't what I thought it was going to well, be. Well, no, 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 no. Actually, there's, there's two, there's something, there's a level to that and there's a deeper level to that. First off would be, yeah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> you don't see a lot of civilians going up after that thing. However... Yeah. We have, you know, I could, I'll send a shot over to you. I use it in my slideshows and I didn't come up with it where I had a funny feeling. It's like, I, technically, if, if, if this is what I think it is, the astronauts, the last thing you're going to do is put any astronaut on a pile of liquid explosives and, and send them up. You would just keep them on the ground in an air force base and then put them in a capsule sometime later. And there was this wonderful guy that came up with, he, he did a whole bunch of research on the internet and he swears and he shows you the side by side photos. He said six out of those seven people are still alive today. They just went into federal re uh, witness relocation, went under slightly different names and they're they're still around walking around. Uh, I, I will send. Wow. I know I will send you that photo and you're saying no nah, that couldn't be it's like you look at two or three of these people and you know how Hollywood has a really hard time aging actors they just never can get it quite right you know because yeah. they put makeup on them it's like nah it still looks like Matt Damon only with a bunch of makeup um, <laughs> yeah. seriously but these people look perfectly aged I mean and they have these facial features you're going man this could be nothing but this guy and so yeah. I will, I will, as soon as I'm done, I will shoot you this, um, this shot. I will, I'll send it to, um, the, the ghost geeks, uh, email address and, and have some fun with that. And then tell me what you think. Awesome. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. Thank you. Oh yeah. Thanks guys. If you need anything else, let me know. Sweet. All right. Have a good night. All right. You too. Bye. Bye. -bye.